thank all three of you uh, for coming along. So it's a film which is running in the running for the Palme d'Or and for the Caméra d'Or because you're a writer originally, aren't you? How how did you how did you move into cinema and towards this particular film? You know, in in a funny way, um, literature and film are all coming from the same place. So they're coming from uh, my sensibility. And my sensibility has been accumulated across my 41 years. And it comes from uh, my reading, seeing film, music, art, conversations with friends, just daily life. So to me, it's not such a big change. I, I, had, I had the idea. It was immediately cinematic, which means I, I didn't have to decide will it be a book or a film. To me, it was immediately cinematic. And so... Um, so I wrote the script, and the script was a, was a stepping stone. Yeah. So you're talking about your inspiration uh, of everyday life and things like this, but where did this amazing story come from? Because it's not a it's not a common story. That that is true, but there are of course there is the uh, fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty, and fairy tales they have uh, deep roots in the ground for all of us. Um, there is the ancient practice of uh, older men seeking the comfort of younger women during the night. For example, King Solomon in the Bible sought to sleep beside young virgins. This subject matter has been treated before in a different way in literature in a couple of novellas mm -hmm. which tell uh, by Kawabata and Gabriel Garcia Marquez which tell the story of from the point of view of the older men who, mm -hmm. who choose to spend the night with young women. But in, and, you know, in a funny way, in terms of a, a personal connection, is um, after my first novel was published, I had a terrible nightmare uh, that I was being filmed in my sleep. And um, uh -huh. it, was such a, it was such an effective nightmare because I was dreaming that I was asleep in my own bed being filmed when I was asleep in my own bed. So it was very hard to tell the difference between what was a dream and what was reality. So I'm sure that that somehow also played into this film where the camera, the point of view in the chamber is quite like it was <laughs> in my dream. Uh, so a dream, a dream, a dream and a nightmare, nightmare as well, in fact, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, Emily, Emily Browning, what, what attracted you to this character? Why did you accept to, to, to play the role? Um, well, the first thing... When I when I read the script for the first time, just reading that that beginning scene where where Lucy's being experimented upon, um, just having the tube stuck down her throat, it actually mm. gave me kind of an anxiety attack. And at that point, I kind of wanted to do the film immediately because when when I have such a strong physical reaction to material like that, I'm automatically excited by it, you know. Um, but I think this character is kind of, you know, just. The, the antithesis of me, really. She's, she's sort of stoic and, and almost kind of cold in a way and, and right. very composed. And I think it was really interesting to find that physically. But also I just, I mean, the script is, is still one of my favorite scripts that, that I've ever read. And I was just really affected by the material. So she's a girl who, who is very passive. Yeah, absolutely. I think almost kind of perversely passive kind of just allowing things to happen to her and I think it's really interesting to see that spiral out of control to the point that she sort of needs to claw her way back up into the real world and, and sort of reconnect. But you suffered all of this as an actress at the same time. Did you give any limits to your director? Did you give any limits to Julie Lee? Say, no, I don't want to go there, I don't want to do that. How did you work together? What were the discussions like between you? I don't know. You? Was there anything I didn't want to do? <laughs> I, don't, I, I think there was something very disgusting that Chris Hayward suggested that we didn't do. Yeah, there were a few, <laughs> there were a few but, things. But we both, but we we both just, disagreed with that. Yeah, yeah. We... Uh, Yes, it's funny, isn't it? We just sort of had a mutual trust. And uh, I also was very careful not to suddenly surprise you with any requests, you know. So it was collaborative. We, because of the shooting style, we had to block the scenes very carefully because the, the shooting style is we're covering it a lot in a, in a sort of a, the camera is a tender witness of what's happening and it's a long shot. 
technically that means we had to uh, work on yeah on the blocking on the mise en scène very carefully and so that was a rehearsal process so on the day on we the day exactly. of, of the shoot we knew what we we knew what we were doing mm -hmm. so so there weren't really surprises i think yeah yeah, I understand. Okay, Rachel, how would you qualify your character? Because um, she's a sort of a witch in a way, because you're in a fairy tale, a sort of a modern witch. But at the same time, there are some very cold aspects. But she's very maternal in a way. It's very complex and ambivalent. How would you define this woman? Um, I suppose ultimately, Clara is an incredibly astute businesswoman. Ultimately. But I don't know whether she'd regard herself as a, um, a madam of sorts, probably more a curator of beautiful objects, probably, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, a, and in a sense providing some sort of peace, you know, offering a service, I suppose. But, um, but it's a difficult question, that. I mean, I, I don't know what drives someone to do the things that she does. Mm -hmm. I, I only know. I, I could only sort of be with Emily and, and sort of... Emily has such a beautiful sort of present it has such a a sort of gentleness to it that I just sort of really responded to that and I just allowed Emily to really inform it more, more than than anything and then under the guidance of Julia but you know I am um, she's a I suppose there's a degree of um, callousness to her isn't there there's a degree of I think I think mm. Clara carries her own compromises in life her yeah. own sorrows yeah, somehow yeah. Yeah. And, uh, mm. the, the relationships between the characters, between uh, the world that you're describing, uh, it's very hard deep down. I mean, there are exchanges, there's a sort of, uh, I don't know, there's a sort of, there's this passive youth which is suffering uh, at the hands of this, uh, this, uh, this aged population. It's a very curious vision you're giving us. Yeah, I mean, one thing about this vision is that I, I'm, I also would like to draw attention to you know, some of the, the the older men in the film, mm. and oui. I hope that the, the the narrative or the world of the film is made whole on by its concerns with age, as well as with youth, and. Um, and I also salute the, the male actors who also had very demanding roles because there's male nudity as well. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, h h how, we, how we live our lives and how we come to the end of our lives is, is a part of the story. La mort est aussi death. Là, death is sort of hovering yeah, over death the film, haunted, even yeah. with the young people. I would say it's haunted by death. Maybe. Uh. Mm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you, Rachel Blake. Thank you very much, Emily Browning. And congratulations to all three of you. So Sleeping Beauty, second film in...